Greetings. The Lord is with you. I know some of you will be joining on. I, I want to get going. It's Friday evening, my day off. And I don't always start right uh, anywhere near 7, but I'm close to 7 tonight. Uh, good evening, Jill. Um, and uh, I, we're on uh, the book of James. Last night we began, and we'll be in chapter 2 today. Uh, good evening, Shirley. Glad to see you are on as well. Well, we'll begin as we make the sign of the cross together and say we are under the care of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I'd like to uh, um, have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, thank you for our time together this evening uh, in your word. Um, thank you for all who join live and those who watch later. Father, thank you for the joy I have of just going deeper into your word and teaching on every chapter of the New Testament this year. Um, so even on my day off, I'm, I'm, I'm committed, but I'm, I'm blessed to be able to, to do this work through the New Testament. I pray, Lord, your blessing on us as we journey together this year. And as we come into um, looking at your word from a, another perspective, uh, today. Um, we ask, Lord, you would help us to work our way, walk our way through the teaching that James has to give. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as a Lutheran, James is a difficult book for, for most of us who are Lutherans to, to uh, look at. What's interesting for us in our readings, I think the the Navigator five by five by five plan has been interesting in how it's taken us through readings. Of first with the Gospel, the first one written maybe uh, the Gospel of Mark, uh, the shortest of the Gospels, and used by Luke and Matthew. So so we know it came before those two. Um, and, and then we went to the book of Acts, the story of Christ leading to the story of the early church. And then we went to the uh, book of uh, Galatians as Paul uh, shares with us, um, excuse me, the book of Hebrews, where we're comparing all the great Old Testament themes uh, and seeing how they compare to Christ. And then we went to, uh, to Galatians, which is a champion uh, of the gospel uh, and how the gospel is central to our faith. And now, after hearing about how central the gospel is, uh, what Christ does for saving by faith alone, through Christ alone, now we come up with the book about works. And this has been the problem for Martin Luther. He didn't like this book, he, and he didn't like the uh, the book of Esther because it never mentions God at all. Um and, and I suppose what's true about us as humans is we all have favorite books. I, I tend to really like the Gospel of John. Um, but you know me, I have favorite scriptures, passages uh, in all the books of the Bible, but I really do like the Gospel of John. Um, but, but James has some important words for us to hear, and they're kind of like an opposite view. And so we need to listen to this word and, and maybe understand the word that that um, uh, James is trying to share with us. So uh, we're going to get that today as we get into chapter two. I, as I introduced it yesterday, uh, James has, after chapter one, in chapters two through five, 12 uh, teachings, uh, words of advice for the church as it has spread after the persecution in Jerusalem, the church spread out, and he has these words of advice for, as he titled it, the 12 tribes in the dispersion. The church is the new Israel, and its persecution has pushed it out, and so he's writing to a word of, of encouragement, to the tw or a word of admonition to the, church, the, the churches, or to Christians who have spread out after the persecution. And the first two of these words of advice um, are here in chapter 2. And in chapter 2, and I haven't gone all the way through in, in my details to, to look at, at each of the things, but, but it seems to me right here in the first couple of chapters that everywhere that, that Paul is uh, talking, uh, he's using, um, there's two things that we see. 
at the end of the section, and there's two sections we see today, there's a pithy statement. Um, we, we said yesterday, James kind of written in the style of the book of Proverbs, wise sayings, and uh, centered on the teachings of Jesus, especially the Sermon on the Mount. There's so much correlation. Uh, there's wise sayings, and then in today, he, he prefaces each of these statements by writing to my brothers. This is familial language. He's writing to the people whom he loves. He's, he's not writing uh, just a disinterested, dispassionate uh, article to people he's never met, but he's writing to the church whom he loves. And again, James, the brother of Jesus, sometimes called James the Just, uh, had become the head of the church in Rome. I want to say as we just get going, hi to Ray and Mary. God bless you and, and good evening to you. Well, here we go. Um, the first of these wise teachings is about showing partiality. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him. But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? Um, he's about halfway done with this first little teaching. So we'll take a break there. Show no partiality. Um, if someone comes into church, it, it sounds just like if you're writing to a church, um, maybe like the bishop writing to the pastors and the church councils of all the churches in the mission district, um, you might just give some wise advice. I remember one of my bishops was talking to some young men who were uh, thinking about enter, uh, going to become pastors. And, and he gave them some piece of, of advice and one of them, he remembered saying that uh, uh, he had a, a new secretary first day on the job at, at a particular church he was serving, and he had to be gone at lunch. And she'd just come in at nine o'clock, and he was leaving right away, and she would be handling the phones, and, and, and he hadn't had much time to talk with her yet. And, and he apologized as he was leaving the office, and he said, let me just say this. When you hear something, you are not going to hear the whole story. That was his piece of advice. When he came back, and then maybe uh, sometime later, she was visiting with him, and she said, boy, Pastor, uh, wasn't that the best advice? Wasn't that true? You hear something about somebody or something happening. You have not gotten the whole story. Um and he was just giving her a piece of cautionary advice um, to realize there's more to every story about people's lives. Uh, and, a, and a secretary is privileged to that information. Well, uh, here's this wise advice that he's giving, that James is giving to these church leaders the, spread around uh, the, the, the world, but but probably a smaller region than the whole world. But uh, as the church had been spread out from persecution, remember he's martyred in 62 AD. Um, so uh, it, it, by, by 62, Paul's almost at Rome, uh, but on his three missionary journeys. So the church is spreading around the Mediterranean world, at least. Um, and his first piece of advice is a story. If you got two people coming into your church and you pay attention to the rich man and not to the poor man, you mistreat the poor man, 
Then he says, have you not made a distinction among yourselves? Have you not looked at people differently? Have you not looked at them differently based simply on how much money they have? And you have become a judge with evil thoughts. If you look at people based and you give preference to people who are rich rather than poor, you are a judge with evil thoughts. Well, you know, that's a challenge in churches. It's a challenge for us as individuals and certainly in the church. How do we treat the poor? Jesus uh, cared deeply and passionately about the poor. If we're going to be followers of Jesus, it won't be told by how well we treat the rich. Everybody treats the rich well. It, that how, how we're followers of Jesus will show in a practical way, and this is a very practical book, by how we treat the poor. And if you judge people based on how much or how little they have, you're judging with evil in your heart, with an evil distinction. And God, uh, then James tells him why. God has chosen, and he calls them my beloved brothers. Don't go down this road. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, for he has prom which he has promised to those who love him? The poor love Jesus. The rich may well love them too, but so do the poor. And if you judge them lesser than the rich based on money and not and not take into consideration that they just love Jesus. Wouldn't it be great if we could tell? And, and, and of course, who are you and I to tell? I, I think we could often tell who's richer and who's poor, or at least we can tell who puts on airs of being rich. Maybe they don't have the money or maybe they're, they borrowed everything they can borrow to make it look like they're rich. But what does it mean to be rich? Jesus talked in the Sermon on the Mount about being rich toward God. Uh, and in and, and, and all his teachings, being rich toward God, that's something that's important. And how do you tell if someone is rich toward God? How do you tell if they love God? Well, he's going to talk about that in the next section. So, so now here, um, as we're moving on in this first section, um, uh, the poor, what are they? They're the, the, the rich. Who are they? They're, aren't the rich the people who have the money to take you to court? And poor people don't have money to hire lawyers to take you to court. So so when you do get dragged to court, it's probably rich people are doing it. Why are you showing preference to them? That was his first argument. Second argument here at verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, what's that? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You are doing well. If you love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well. But if you show partiality you're committing sin and are convicted by the law as a transgressor. This is a hard saying. Uh, the book of James is very practical, and so he gets very real in being practical. If you show partiality towards um, one person over another, you're especially based on their wealth or lack thereof, you are a transgressor of the law. You are committing sin. And then he, he has this, well, that's, it's not such a bad sin, is it? Well, here's a truth about sin. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point had become guilty of it all. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. You're a lawbreaker no matter what law you break, even if it's one that shows um, that, that, that it's the sin of showing partiality. Oh, that's not so bad. You've broken God's law. Um, you are a sinner. And it's not be that we're going to hell for one sin. We are forgiven sinners. But it should break our heart for the things that break God's heart. If you com do not commit, if you... Um, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. 
the law of forgiveness, the law of grace, the law of God's love. Act in such a way that you look at people as God looks at them, not as the world. There ought to be some difference in the church. There ought to be difference in your life, how you treat people if you could see them through the eyes of Christ. For judgment, if you're going to start judging people, then know this, and here he comes to his pithy statement. Judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Oh, Jesus has told parables about that. Remember the man who owed the king 10,000 talents and the king forgave him, and he went out and found a guy who owed him 100 denarius, and he threw him in jail when he couldn't pay. And, and when the king heard it, he was aghast and threw that man into jail and sold all he had, and boy, he was in trouble. Judgment is without mercy to those who show no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What a gift. That's the pithy statement. Mercy, love, gracious love. Um, again, the word grace and mercy are different, and that grace um, means that I, I don't get what I... I, excuse me, I get what I don't deserve, and mercy means I don't get what I do deserve. Mercy triumphs over judgment. God's mercy in your life triumphs over judgment, God's judgment in your life. Boy, that's good news. And mercy, as you show it to other, will triumph over judgment. Mercy will create a church that is attractive to others. Let's let mercy show in our lives. What else can show in our lives? Uh, in chapter two here, uh, the second of the 12 uh, pieces of wise advice for the church that James is giving is about faith and works. And uh, the pithy statement at the end says, faith apart from works is dead. You can remember that. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Pithy statement number one. Faith without works is dead. So we come to this section again. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? It's a question. Here's the part we Lutherans really tremble with because we are not saved by our works. And I don't believe, although he's going to say it, I, I don't believe that James thinks we're saved by our works. Uh, he's a Christian, after all, who knows he's saved by the death of Jesus Christ and him alone. Um, but let's hear what he says about faith and works. If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? Well, here's a story. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to him, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Uh, the context of this is that yesterday we were in worship and we were talking about the end of the service, the dismissal, go in peace, serve the Lord, thanks be to God. Um, and, and right here, what, what good would it be at our service if we saw someone who didn't have enough clothes, we said, well, go in peace, serve the Lord, and they couldn't go in peace because they didn't have what they needed to be able to leave in wholeness and the way God intended them to be blessed. Now, you can't see a person going out into the cold and say, keep warm, when you see they don't have a coat. If you really care about them being warm, then give them a coat. He goes on to say, but someone will say, well, you have faith and I have works. Some people have faith and some people have works. No, it doesn't work that way. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. How do you know someone believes? Is it something they say? Well, maybe, but it can't be just something they say. A, a person whose life has been changed by Jesus Christ, who is a new creation, their life will exhibit more of the fruit of the Spirit and less of the works of the flesh. The battle 
of the old sinful nature will surely be there in all of us. But first of all, as Christians, we confess our sins. We understand that we're sinners. We don't try to be who we're not. And, and, and we, we say about ourselves that, yes, we are sinners and we are saved by grace. And then that begins to change how we live. And we are changed, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, from one degree of glory to another, we're becoming more and more like Christ. So here James says, I will show you my faith by my works. He doesn't say, I will get grace by, by works. Works will never give us grace, and, and they don't lead us to, to faith. But faith results in works. It's what Jesus talked about in John 15 about the vine and the branches. Unless a branch abides in the vine, it, it, will, it will bear no fruit, and it will just be cut off by the vine dresser. But if it bears, if it is, remains or abides in the vine, it will bear much fruit. So our lives, if we're abiding in Christ, if we have faith, we'll have works. So here's where some Lutherans would, would get upset. Oh, wait, there's too much conversation about works. No, works are the fruit. They don't save us, but they're a natural outcome of the Spirit's work in our life. And if there's no evidence, no fruit, well, then the branch must not be abiding in the vine. At least that's how I understand this argument. We'll go on to hear what he has to say. So if you're just going around saying, God bless you, brother, but you're no blessing to your brother, <laughs> what good is that? I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one if you have the correct understanding. You believe that God is one. Um, the, the, the beginning of the great Shema, the, the basic teaching of Judaism, God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, um, soul, mind, and strength. Uh, you believe this, this basic teaching? Well, you do well. <laughs> Even the demons, demons believe and shudder. Well, the demons, the devil knows that God is one, but he's not a Christian. He's not going to be saved. He's going to hell where he belongs. So... If faith is just some mental thing, things you think about, but it has no reflection in your life, well, what's that doing for you? Uh, does it, um, I, I, can, I can say, I think it'd be a good idea for the branch to abide in the vine, but thinking is not the same as abiding in Christ. Maybe I'm just living by my own works. Do you not? Uh, do you want to? Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? <laughs> it's the difficult language for us Lutherans. And now it gets even worse. He's going to pick on Abraham, and we were just in Galatians, and Paul was picking on Abraham as the example that we're saved by faith, not by works, which I think he was talking about a different issue: how we're saved. By faith, apart from works, absolutely. Um, Abraham was saved 430 years in Galatians before the law was given. He was saved, he was declared righteous by his faith. Um, we, we saw those quotes of Genesis 12, Genesis 15, Genesis 18. But he, but James is going to look at another part of of. of of Abraham's life. Where where do you see that Abraham trusted God? Well, when he left Ur of the Chaldeans and he traveled in the promised land, where do you see that he failed to trust? Well, when he had the son Ishmael by the slave woman Hagar, but he got back to trusting when he had the son by, uh, by the woman of the promise by Sarah. Uh, that son's name was Isaac. There was evidence of times in his life that he was not trusting God when he lied to Abimelech about Sarah being his sister. Um, well, it was a half-truth. <laughs> but there's times where we see him trusting. Well, so he's going to use Abraham. What's he going to do? Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father? Uh, I don't like these words, but they're God's words. So let's hear what he has to say. 
Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Wait, he saved by his works when he offered up Isaac? No, God declared him righteous in chapter 15. This is much later um, in, in Galatians, in Genesis, excuse me, in Genesis, Genesis chapter 22. Um, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Again, that's Genesis 15. But in Genesis 22, we hear about the sacrifice of Isaac. And so I don't think James is thinking. I, I honestly don't. Uh, because it would be the opposite of the whole gospel message in the New Testament. And the whole essence of what Paul was talking about in Galatians. This is such a wonderful, wonderful book to go to right after hearing the, the heart of the gospel proclaimed. And it has to be true in Galatians. So what is James talking about? Seems to me it's that what he began to talk about, that if you have faith but no works, your faith is like a branch that is not implanted in the vine and it won't grow any fruit and it'll just be cut off. There is no real faith that doesn't have the life of God flowing into a person and producing fruit. As Paul says in Galatians, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Uh, these things will show up in your life. And if there's no evidence, well, that'd be a little bit of a time to take a self-reflection and say, how am I connected to Christ? I may believe, but how am I living it out in my connection to him? You see that faith was active along with his works and com faith was completed by his works. In other words, I think Paul sa or James is saying, how can you tell Abraham believed God and was righteous? Because he was willing even to give up his son Isaac. That trust in God is magnificent. And of course, God told him, no, you can't sacrifice your son. Only God can sacrifice his son for the world. Abraham can't sacrifice his son. But God tested him, had no intention of letting him fulfill that test, but wanted to see how far Abraham would go. And he went as far as binding his son, placing him on the altar, picking up the knight and, and ready to kill his son. It's just a horrid story. So horrible that only God could do it to his own son. But he stopped to Abraham and showed Abraham the ram caught by its horns in the bush. And Abraham offered the ram instead of the son. And God offers his son for the sins of the world. Um, God's love is proven in the, in the story or comes to its fulfillment. We see it most clearly in the death of Jesus on the cross. And Moses, excuse me, Abraham's faith in the same way is revealed most fully in his willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac. Abraham believed God, uh, verse 50, uh, Genesis 15, we're in verse 23, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. What a wonderful little phrase that is. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7, uh, we have that reference. I think Isaiah 41 you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Um, I'm sure glad we had Galatians so that we could see the pure gospel that Paul was willing to be angry about, uh, to fight the Judaizers, the circumcision party that says, no, Jesus isn't good enough. You also have to follow the law. Well, there's no hope in that because no one follows the law. And by the law, everyone is judged and condemned as sinners. Uh, just as James has said, if you break one part of the law, you're guilty of all of it. So don't be judging other people. You're going to be judged. 
mercy triumphs over judgment was that pithy stain. So, so here we we uh, we see that that we are, you see a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. These are the things that that gave heartburn to Luther as he read these things. Um, but when faith is the is the ev evidence, excuse me, when works are the evidence of faith. We are saved not by our works, but by our faith, by our trust in God. But when we trust in God alone, that doesn't mean we can just do whatever we want and God will forgive us. It means that the life of God will be flowing in us, and if it's in us, it will flow out of us to others. And so wait, works become the evidence of a life that is lived with faith. And I know he says it in not such a clear way, but that's the way we have it. Um, I think that's why it takes some discernment to, to read the whole word of God and do it with understanding the word together. If we judge, just read read James and we we didn't read Galatians, I think we'd be skewed. But reading them together, we understand that we are saved by faith alone. But faith without works is dead. And of course, that's the pithy statement. Let's get down there. In the same way, so illustration number one was, was Abraham. Abraham's faith was revealed by his works. So was Rahab. In the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? Well, yes, but it was her faith in God that caused her to believe that God was sending the Israelites and her faith in God uh, caused her to treat the spies w well and to, to help spare their lives and to send them safely on their way after hiding them. It was her faith that led to her works. And so we see her saved by her works, which came from her faith. F faith is what starts the whole thing, but it shows up in works. And so we see Rahab was saved because she spared the lives of the spies and she was guaranteed by the spies that she hung this certain cord out her window that the, the soldiers going in that direction would spare her and her whole household with her. So she gathered all her family, all, uh, uh, all her extended family into her home. And when the walls came tumbling down and the Israelites dashed into the city, she was spared because of her faith but her faith seen by her works. So his pithy saying here at the end of this section, number two, is for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, if the breath goes out, then you're just dead. So faith apart from works is dead. We don't get to believe by our works, but if our faith has no works, what kind of faith is that? This is a word of just practical, wise sayings to the churches that have been spread out because of the persecution. Don't show favoritism to the rich. Remember the poor. And, and don't, uh, don't think it's just about what we believe. But our, our, our faith comes through us in the way we relate to one another. Well, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time together this evening. Those who could join on this Friday. Pray your blessing on each of us as we think, Lord, about how we show preferences. Save us from that. And Lord, how sometimes we become content about having the right faith or the right understanding, but help it to move down into our lives and transform us to be gentle and humble and kindly and full of love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness, that our lives might display the life of Christ. Work in us to move us to be a, uh, from one degree of glory to another, a better reflection of Jesus in our individual lives and in our congregations. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining me tonight. Have a blessed weekend. I'll be on tomorrow. Uh, we'll have church at 3.30 on Facebook and then Sunday morning at, at 9 and 11 for uh, the church website and YouTube channel. God bless you and remember, God loves you.
and so do I. Bye-bye. And hi, Christine and, and Tom. I see that you've been on as well. God bless you guys. And, and God's love and mine to you as well. Bye-bye.